Okay, here's the long-awaited lecture on the impact of money on African subsistence economy by Paul Bohannon, 1959, which I sometimes refer to as the TIV article. Um, so the TIV are a, an ethnic group um, in Nigeria, and specifically in a uh, region of Nigeria that is known as TIVland. Um, and so that shows where that is within the modern day uh, country of Nigeria. Um, now again, this was taking place in, um, or the article was written in 1959. Um, and it was an attempt to look into the current state, but also the history of the TIV, the traditional TIV economy, and to look at um, the types of, of money that you might find there and um, what the consequences were of the introduction of a general purpose currency um, by the British was um, on, on the TIV economy and on, on the TIV way of life. So Bohannon talks about how this, uh, traditionally this economy was a multi-centric economy, which means that there are multiple spheres, in this case three, um, that are separate from one another. Now, there, there can be some interaction between these spheres of the economy, um, but in large part, they're quite separate. Um, so recall that, you know, an economy is, is the sum of all, um, all social institutions and labor and practices and exchange um, that goes into producing um, goods and services and, and exchanging and consuming goods and services. I said exchange twice. Um, but so, so it encompasses, you know, how you make your living, but, but also any kind of transactions in um, goods or services that can be traded or exchanged. Um, so in the traditional TIV economy, there were these three separate spheres. Uh, one was called YAG. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but that's my best um, attempt. And that was a subsistence, that was a sphere of subsistence goods. So foodstuffs, um, basic farming tools, uh, tools that you would need to make some of those farming tools. Um, also small livestock like chickens, um, maybe, maybe pigs, for example, um, handicrafts, things like that. And that operated in a uh, market type system where uh, it was primarily, if not exclusively, women that were running the market. And the exchange would take place either through gift exchange or through direct barter. And even though um, I mentioned in the the uh, lectures on economics that barter prior to the advent of money in a market economy is quite rare. Here you have some, some degree of barter um, in these subsistence goods. And the market was a local market, you know, just for a relatively small area. Um, it wasn't like a nationwide type of market. Um, then you have um, shagba, which is a prestige sphere. So these are these are goods that not everybody necessarily gets their hands on. Um, these these are goods that you know convey some kind of um, social wealth upon an individual, um, aka prestige. So within this sphere, you had um, cattle. You had certain uh, ritual offices, um, offices like like appointments, um, you know, positions uh, that carried a lot of prestige with them. Um, certain types of medicine or, um, or or herbal interventions or or curing ceremonies. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna jump over the rods for a second. You had slaves. Um, now, I'm not sure what specific type of of slavery we're talking about. We're, I, we're not talking about chattel slavery, um, like in the Atlantic transatlantic slave trade. Um, you know, we're probably talking more about like indentured servitude. Um, Tagudu, which is a which was a type of white cloth that was apparently quite prestigious. And then these brass rods. Um, so the brass rods were also sort of a, um, a medium of exchange, um, which I'll get back to in, in, in a little bit. And then the third sphere was exchange marriage. And so traditionally, the way that marriage worked in um, Tivland was a... The article says this, the simplest form would be a man would trade his sister in marriage to another man for his sister. So they would they would exchange sisters in marriage. Now, um, and th this is not like a super uncommon type of uh, arrangement in uh, small scale and or traditional societies. Um, but he, Bohannon says in the article that it doesn't it never really worked that way. It rarely actually was that simple. The way it usually worked was there would be a patrilineally related group of men. So they would belong to the same patrilineage and they would be in charge of a certain number of wards from their, presumably initially from their patrilineage. So, you know, um, sisters, cousins, what have you, um, from their patrilineage. And, and they would sort of divvy up those women among the men in this, in this uh, ward system. And then those men could exchange those women for wives um, with another ward group. Uh, now, Bohannon does say that, you know, obviously for this system to work, the the women actually, you know, they, they, they have a say, like they have to be kind of okay with this. Um, now to what degree they had a say, how egalitarian it was, I don't know. He doesn't really get into all of that, but, um, it wasn't like, uh, a woman was just forced to marry someone with no, no word about it whatsoever. Uh, but you know, these types of exchange marriages, again, like I said, are not super uncommon. And, and the reason is it's, um, it's solidifying ties between lineages. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a more formal ceremonial way. It's like, it's kind of like an arranged marriage. Um, but it, it also like builds a structure upon marriage through which, uh, you know, these lineages can, can form connections. Uh, okay. So, um, so as I said, in the Yag uh, sphere, the exchange of, of the goods was mostly through barter or gift giving. Now in the Shagba or prestige sphere, brass rods could be exchanged for pretty much anything in that sphere. Um, so you could also kind of quote the cost of anything in that sphere in terms of, or the price uh, in terms of brass rods. Um, Tagudu cloth could be traded for several of the things in the sphere, cattle offices, medicine. Cattle could be traded for slaves or offices. Slaves could be traded for offices um, and so on and so forth. So, um, so brass rods in that sphere uh, really take on all of the functions of a general purpose money, remember, which is um, a mode of payment, a medium of exchange, and a, um, uh, basically a way to, to, uh, to put a value on something, right? Um, so, but brass rods were only a general purpose currency, uh, in that particular sphere, okay? And they weren't the only uh, 
uh, means of exchange, right? Um, because Tegudu, any of the things in the prestige sphere could be used to exchange for something in the prestige sphere, okay? Um, as far as the exchange marriage sphere, um, the only um, means of exchange was a, a like exchange in marriage rights and kinship rights um, to a woman. So each of these spheres had different values associated with them. So the Yag sphere was kind of the most basic. Um, it didn't make you particularly wealthy to exchange within the Yag sphere. That's something that, you know, pretty much anyone could do. The prestige sphere obviously had prestige associated with it, but the most highly valued type of exchange um, in the traditional TIV economy was exchange marriage, okay? Now, so, so you see these spheres right now seem to be completely separate. There's no, there's no special purpose money or general purpose money so far in the YAG sphere. There's one general purpose money and several special purpose monies in the Shagba or prestige sphere. Um, and then, you, you know, you can't, I don't, I don't even know if it's, if it makes sense to call woman, uh, a woman in the, in the exchange marriage sphere, uh, like a special purpose money. Um, there really wasn't any in that, um, in that sphere. Now, okay. So there's something called conveyances. He makes a distinction between conveyances and conversions. A conveyance is exchange within the sphere. So if you're bartering, if you have some yams and you would like some, some like ground nuts or some peanuts, um, you could make an exchange uh, with someone else in the market for that. And that would be considered a conveyance. Um, in the Shagba sphere, you could, you could exchange Tegudu cloth for cattle and that would be considered a conveyance. Right. In the exchange marriage sphere, you're exchanging women in marriage between lineages, and that's a conveyance. A conversion would be exchanging between spheres, and there, there were specific, limited ways in which you could do that. Uh, so one of the things you could do was, in rare circumstances, you could, uh, you, you could exchange uh, brass rods for something in the subsistence sphere. Um, I should mention, I, I didn't say yet, but the, br these brass rods, they originally came from, uh, they were originally like European imports and they could be made, used to make jewelry or used to make casts uh, for other, uh, to make other metal items. Um, but they, they ended up, at least in Tivland, being used um, as a prestige item and, and a way to, uh, like a, a means of exchange. Um, so you, like brass rods are, they're not divisible. They're these, they're these long, they're like three feet long. They're like a, like a fourth of an inch thick. Um, and they're not, you can't really, they're not designed to make change, right? There's no standard, there's no standard amount. There's no, breaking it down into, you know, quarters and dimes and nickels and pennies. Um, so um, it's, not, it's not divisible. And it doesn't have traditionally a, a really specific value except in the prestige sphere, um, depending on what you were exchanging it for. So in most circumstances, it would be embarrassing to use a brass rod to get something from the subsistence sphere. Um, because that's like, you know, trading your Mercedes for a dozen eggs at the supermarket. You know, it doesn't make that much sense. Um, and you're not going to need enough eggs to be worth a Mercedes, you know. So why would someone do it? Uh, they would typically do it if, for special occasions, for ceremonies, if, if they were throwing a feast and 
there were going to be so many people and there was going to be so much food that was needed for this feast that um, it, it would be too much of a burden to use their own foodstuffs from, um, you know, a, in the article he says, uh, from their wives' food stores. So I suppose um, wives were kind of in charge of, of that, of the, uh, maybe of the fields, of the gardens, of, of the store of food. Um, so if you needed extra and you didn't want to put too much of a strain on your own supplies, you could, you could use a brass rod to get a bunch of stuff at the market. Um, you know, in which case, uh, even though it's embarrassing to do that, you could say, I'm doing it for the greater good. I'm doing it to throw a feast for my kin. Right. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, trading up, so converting up was something that was seen as, as a really good move. Um, and there is a certain way in which you could gain certain rights that are similar to aspects of marriage through the use of brass rods, and that was called chem marriage. Um, there, were sort of, there were sort of two similar but different things that you could do in this regard. One was if you, uh, if a man were to have a, a marriage with a woman, but he didn't have a ward that he could trade for her, so he couldn't make an exchange marriage, um, there, if there was like a lag in that. So at some point in the future, um, he would, from his lineage, trade a woman in marriage uh, for his wife. In the meantime, he could put up some kind of a collateral in the form of brass rods uh, or cattle sometimes. Um, I believe they said that. Um, so, but that's just temporary. And you can't put a specific price on that. You can't, you, you could not put a specific price on a person, um, like a, a woman. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't put a certain price on, on kin. You could put a certain price on, on slaves in, in the prestige sphere, but in the marriage sphere, no, you couldn't do that. Um, what you could do, however, was this chem marriage, which is, um, it's, it's not a full exchange marriage. So in exchange marriage, when you, when you do this full exchange, you gain uh, rights in, in the labor of a, of a woman as a wife in, uh, um, the, uh, in, in se sexual rights, I guess. Um, and uh, trying to think if there was something else. Well, so those are kind of like the basics. Um, what you didn't get, though, was, uh, oh, sorry, um, in, in a traditional exchange marriage, you got that, and you got um, the ability to bring any children that that wife bore um, into your patrilineage, right? So they, those children then belong to your lineage. Um, now, with chem marriage, what you could do is you, you could purchase purchase sort of um, the labor and the sexual rights um, with the brass rods, but you couldn't, uh, but you, you didn't automatically get the children as, as part of your lineage. So what you would have to do, that's my dog, uh, what you would have to do is uh, for each of those children, if you wanted to uh, affiliate them with your lineage, you would have to um, essentially buy those rights for each individual child with these brass rods. Whereas if you'd done an exchange marriage, it doesn't matter how many, how many children are born, they're automatically part of your lineage. So with the chem marriage, it's like a piecemeal kind of marriage. It, it, each time there's a child, if you want to affiliate that child with your own uh, lineage, you have to pay every single time. Um, so although it's not considered a full marriage, a chem marriage, um, uh, it, is, it is something that could be used to gain extra prestige because um, if you have an exchange marriage um, and your children become part of your lineage, um, they are 
not just your children, they're your family's children, right? Um, whereas with a chem marriage, if you are using brass rods to affiliate those children to your lineage, um, you have all the say over it. So any daughters that would be born to you could be, um, could be used as wards in other exchange marriages, right? So, um, so the father of those daughters could, um, you know, when they're marriageable age, exchange one for another, another wife for himself. Um, so again, this exchange doesn't, doesn't really mean you're selling someone off. It means, it means that you're, it's, it's, it's an arranged marriage, but it's, it's, a it kind of, it's an arranged marriage that goes both ways. Um, where there's sort of like two marriages happening at once. Um, even if they're not happening at the same time, there could be sort of a, like a lag in this, a delay, a woman that's exchanged could be part of one of these ward systems. And eventually she would marry someone in that lineage, um, more or less. Okay. So rights in terms of kinship were the most prestigious thing. And the idea that you could put an actual price on someone was anathema to Tiv society. Um, okay, so, so each of these spheres had a different, a different um, value placed on them. Um, and uh, if, uh, if a man were to be seen by his kin as becoming too wealthy um, in the prestige sphere or in the exchange marriage sphere, um, his, his kin, or I don't know, perhaps someone even outside of his kin group, could, uh, could sort of put a curse on him um, or sort of bewitch him. And in order for him to, to remove that curse, he would have to pay you know, uh, like a, like a shaman or some kind of spiritual specialist to remove that curse. So the, the idea would be to essentially drain him of some of his wealth because he would have to remove this curse. Um, so there was a built-in system to keep things, you know, relatively equal or, or at least to make sure that inequality didn't, didn't run away. And also you couldn't just amass subsistence and use yams to to buy marriages and to you know to grow your family and to become huge and powerful so um so i guess what i'm getting at and what the article was getting at here is a lot of the values of the society were really tied up in the in the economic system um it wasn't simply utilitarian okay um and and it, it, it brought in other aspects of the culture, right? Um, by looking at this, you can, you can also see the strand that relates to kinship, the strand that relates to subsistence, the strand that relates to, um, you know, social structure and power differentials, this, the strand that relates to gender roles, right? So this is all... Um, you know, you can't completely, you can't take the economy and separate it out from the rest of the cultural system and the cultural values. Um, so how did, how did the economy and the society change after colonization? Um, so there are pluses and minuses, right? Uh, travel became safer um, and easier as a uh, wide swaths of territory became sort of united under, uh, a, you know, a British colony some some of the uh, different kind of lineages or ethnic groups that may have been at odds uh, were sort of obligated to live together in the same system. Um, and presumably there was some kind of military presence um, that also, you know, was, was there to ensure that trade in the colony could go on and conflict wouldn't get in the way. So to, you know, in, in some ways it became safer to travel longer distances outside of the territory of your, you know, extended kin group or your ethnic group. Travel became easier also because there were more roads created, more roads paved. Um, and that, that led to uh, 
more markets and more connectivity between markets and far-flung uh, uh, parts of the territory. Um, also, sticking with Tivland, it became connected to the international economy, right? Because now it's part of a British colony. And obviously, it's part of a British colony because the British want to extract, you know, uh, resources uh, or labor or they want a market for their goods. Um, so all of a sudden now it's connected to the international economy. The government becomes involved in the economy and regulating the economy. Um, the government uh, introduces coinage and taxes. So... Um, at first, they allow some taxes in the form of subsistence goods, but eventually, shortly, shortly after colonization, eventually they want taxes in the form of coinage, uh, which is obviously not something that existed um, in Tivland, right, at the time. So what did they do? Um, they, they, made it, they made it so that... Um, People had to engage in trade in order to get coinage from um, either African traders that had been uh, sort of seeded with, with goods and money by the British uh, or from colonial traders. Um, also, uh, I don't know if I have a bullet point about this further down, but also the British established an exchange rate with brass rods because they wanted to get the brass rods out of the economy. Um, and the coinage in. So brass rods were of no use in the British economy, in the, you know, in the international economy. So, um, so it makes sense for the TIV to exchange them for the coins that they would have to use to pay taxes anyway. And also in an effort to get this general purpose currency that had now uh, been introduced, um, they started growing more cash crops, more crops that could be sold on an international market. Um, and so there's more and more land being devoted to these cash crops uh, and less land being devoted necessarily to um, subsistence crops. So, you know, that creates kind of a problem. Um, also, monocropping is not great. So growing one crop year after year after year in this place is not great for the fertility of the soil. Um, also, their market becomes opened up to international goods and their, their subsistence sphere, which used to be based on gift exchange and barter, now becomes fully part of a supply and demand marketplace. And, and therefore, um, if, uh, if they could fetch a better price on the international market, those foodstuffs would be sold on an international market. Um, conversely, if it were cheaper to bring in things from an international market than to grow them there, that's what would be done. So in a way, it, it, it sort of disables people from being able to provide for themselves. They become part of the ups and downs of the international economy Something happens in a far-flung country that sends ripples through the international economy. You know, things, things like what happened in, in 2008, 2009, um, you know, with the uh, Great Recession. Um, you know, that, that has ripples throughout, you know, the international marketplace, right? So, whereas you could have been self-sufficient here, now you kind of are going with the ebb and flow of the international economy. Um, so it makes it a bit more insecure. Um, and also with the establishment of a general purpose or all-purpose money for, for everything, where brass rods can be quoted in terms of coinage and food can be quoted in terms of coinage, then it makes um, these, this, this marriage sphere uh, confusing to, um, to operate um, because also the British made it illegal um, to do exchange marriages and um, they, they, they basically said um, you can do bride wealth marriages, which is essentially giving goods to a family in exchange for the bride. Um, but 
any of those goods that would have been exchanged before now can be quoted in terms of currency. So it was seen as really distasteful, like you're buying a person, whereas before there's no way that you could put a price on a person. Um, so, uh, so it was something, it was something where it was seen like money was kind of tearing apart their, their values and, uh, their culture. Um, so it was this, it was not just that, but that simple act of introducing a general purpose currency and essentially forcing people to use it because, you know, now they have to pay taxes with it and this, that, and the other, it's like a domino effect. Um, it can completely pull apart different aspects of the fabric of their culture prior to that. Um, so I already mentioned that. Um, so, so that's, so that's it. So basically what I want you to get out of that is again, the economy cannot be cleanly separated from other aspects of culture. Um, you know, it's within economic activity is embedded the values of the culture, um, sometimes gender roles of the culture, um, kin relations of the culture, and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the TIV had a multicentric economy, so three separate spheres. They had no fully general purpose money, except um, brass rods were general purpose money within the prestige sphere only. Um, and I think those are the main things. Uh, oh, and also also the kind of the, the downsides to uh, colonization, you know, how introducing this general purpose currency for everything um, really kind of brought down the house of cards that they had built and, and wealth was able to, to um, wealth inequality was able to increase because now, you know, you can, you can, you can gain money from anything and money is money is money. It doesn't matter if you're selling subsistence. It doesn't matter if you're selling cattle. It doesn't matter uh, if you're exchanging uh, someone in marriage, right? So, it allowed people to have more avenues toward wealth and, and the checks that existed on that wealth um, weren't there anymore, okay? So that's it. Um, don't worry too much about it. I probably will only have one, two, maybe three questions on the exam about that, you know, if that many. Um, but it's an interesting article. It's, it's really complicated. And, and every time I read it, like, I feel like I'm learning something new and I have more questions, so... Um, if you read it, which I hope you did, um, I hope you, I hope it made you think. Okay. So until next time, signing out, see you later.